Uh, black hole games, we've all had our experiences with them. Even if you can't relate to the notion of, of having something important to do and instead burying 60 hours of your life under your ninth playthrough of Skyrim, you've had some kind of run-in with black hole games. Remember when you spent two months trying to 100% a game made for dumb, stupid babies? Black hole. What about the time when you and Z played trash compactors and monster trucks on Halo 3 Customs every day after school for five months? Black ditch. How about when you racked up over 800 hours on MW2 in sixth grade alone? Black fucking crater. Didn't you piss and shit yourself instead of going to the bathroom during your 38 hour Fortnite bender? Black universe. Black hole games might be kind of dangerous, but they also might be some of the most important parts of our gaming careers. I'd assert that there are three main types of black hole games. I, I, I'd also assert, I don't really know what the fuck I'm talking about, but, but here we go. Number one. Guardians of the Galaxy. Number two, th these are the games that are so vast and well-produced that how could you not dedicate your whole life to it? And taking the slot at number three, I have 500 hours on NBA 2K14 on Steam and I don't remember how or why. So this may come as a little bit of a surprise, but we're actually gonna start with the first one. So uh, no, I'm not talking about the critically acclaimed mobile app, Guardians of the Galaxy, hooked on a feeling, pie. I'm actually making a quite, uh, witty analogy about braving the dangers of black holes in space with your boys. So basically we're talking about multiplayer games like Fortnite, uh, Call of Duty, Halo, every fucking MOBA ever made. Games that are in and of themselves the same thing over and over. Not you, baby. You're, you're special. But somehow, don't get boring. If anything, the monotony leads to some of the most intense and visceral competition you'll ever experience. One of the pivotal things that helps expedite your loss of time is your boys. Building a new map in Halo or, or nay naying on that sweet victory royale in Fortnite may be your objective, but it's also just a medium to cooperate and inevitably communicate on a more personal level with your boys. And, and once you start talking about who has a bigger dick, Doom Guy or Master Chief, it's already the next morning. So now on to category two. These are the games that build worlds so vast and so interesting slash dynamic that you can never really beat them. But just the chase to do so leads you down the most beautiful and absolutely engulfing experience ever. I'd say that the key to a game like this getting us hooked on phonics is the world feeling alive. Random encounters, hidden quests, easter eggs, player traits that interact with the world around you, these are the things that make a game world feel unrepeatable. Like no one is experiencing the same thing as you, which is the peak of immersion. Our last category, I have 500 hours on NBA 2K14 on Steam, and I have no fucking idea why, might just be our most important, because these are your normal games, the games that you don't suspect, that find their hooks in you and don't fucking let go. It could be an amazingly crafted and addictive feedback loop like Game Dev Tycoon. It could be that, that underlying promise of personal progress at a skill like Guitar Hero. It could be a game purposefully crafted to prey on your addictive personality and steal $600 from you like Madden Ultimate Team. That didn't happen to me. And it could just be finding a game at the right point in your life and, and, and forming a connection with it, which is how my abusive relationship with Assassin's Creed started, so. <laughs> I don't want to do another trailing mission, please. Oh, James, maybe you should move on. Assassin's Creed hasn't treated you right for years. Oh, he's rough on the outside, but he's really great deep down. Because I'm not talking to anybody, Creed. Oh, okay, uh, th there are also games that we should talk about that utilize all of these techniques uh, to suck years and years of your life away from you. They've made friendships blossom, and they've made them implode. They've torn families apart at the seams, and they've made people shove remotes up their ass. That's right, we're talking about MMOs. More specifically, Wow. While some games charm you with their uniquity, World of Warcraft slips a little something in your drink and takes you on a magical journey. I remember reading an article somewhere that said that psychologists helped Blizzard develop the, the maps, the music, and even the color palettes to keep players as entranced as possible for as long as possible. Now, that could be complete horseshit, but there are also a lot of players who would probably vouch for that. I think a lot of the players going into World of Warcraft not only wanted to be entertained and have fun, but also wanted to have a second or new life. A life where you're not Jack from the IT department who hasn't talked to a girl in eight months. You're Dolph Vladwick, the Alpha Chad gamer who definitely talks to girls. And when it comes down to it, Dolph is probably a simp because, you know, it's still Jack behind an epic Ventrilo nickname. But I think that wanting to experience a new life, or at least escape the one you're in for a little while, is a more widespread feeling than we'd think. Also, that's a good segue to the next chunk of the video, 
escapism. If you're wondering what escapism is, I guess I'll give you a quick definition off the top of my head. Escapism is the tendency to seek distraction and relief from unpleasant realities, especially by seeking entertainment or engaging in fantasy. I'd say that your likeliness to use escapism as a coping mechanism directly translates to your susceptibility to black hole games. The more you want to be immersed and sink into a game, whether you know it or not, the more it's gonna pull you in. Fair warning for those familiar with my content, this next segment is gonna be a little bit more explicatory and personal than normal. At points, it may seem like I'm just going on about me and my struggles in life, but I'm trying to highlight the fact that we've all had our hardships, and through those hardships, we found our most intimate and integral bonds to forms of entertainment. Before I could comprehend the grander message of the words I read off a page, I was obsessed with Harry Potter. Before I, I needed it to mean anything to me, it meant everything to me. And it opened my eyes to the power of fictional worlds at a very young age. Few things meant as much to me as Harry Potter and his band of friends did throughout my childhood. I'd say the only things that matched up were uh, my dogs, my family, Lord of the Rings, and most importantly, uh, cheeseburgers. When I hit middle school, my sense of uh, wonder was diminished a bit by the fact that uh, I had no friends. Uh, Harry couldn't count as one, which frankly, kind of bullshit. And uh, social dynamics meant a lot more than they used to. Uh. So I set out to find friends, and I, I quickly did, and they were all obsessed with one thing, Xbox Live. So I pleaded with my parents, my, my uh, 12th birthday was coming up, could I please get Xbox Live? And my parents had been playing World of Warcraft since it was in beta, so they knew the terrors that online gaming contained. But for my 12th birthday, they got me Xbox Live and my first of 387 Microsoft chat headsets. And the next two years of my life were spent within a skyscraper, in a sandbox. When I found out in seventh grade that I was too fat to play football, which was probably because I spent the last 10 months in my gamer rocking chair, I was pretty distraught. I'd been playing football since I was four or five years old, um, but I found comfort in the most unlikely of creatures. I had always really enjoyed Lord of the Rings. I don't know why it entranced me the way it had as a child, but it did. But after reading The Hobbit in seventh grade, that enjoyment was taken to another level. The vast, beautiful world of Middle Earth became my playground. I watched the director's cut of the entire trilogy every month for the next 13 months straight. I knew the opening act of The Fellowship by heart. I took my imagination to the lands of the Silmarillion. I watched every single second of Lord of the Rings BTS footage. I, I reveled in fan-made documentaries. And I explored Tolkien's wonderful life to no end. And then the eighth grade was good. Eighth grade was great, actually. I don't remember much from it. Um, and then ninth grade came, and it was bad. And uh, that's when I discovered post-hardcore music. And uh, also went to the most concerts I've went to in any period of my life. Tenth grade was worse, and then I lost one of my dogs, Clyde. But I spent the rest of that year in the Mojave Wastelands after that, so that helped a little bit. But then a lot of things came to fruition, and I got a license and lost a bunch of weight and stuff like that. So 11th and 12th grade were really good, although I don't remember any of it. And then the first year of college kicked my ass. I put all my weight back on, my girlfriend moved away, I lost a couple friends, and I had no fucking idea what I wanted to do with my life. But then I found YouTube. I started religiously watching Mark, Jack, and Pewds. I absorbed every bit of H3H3's backlog with all my meals, which were a lot then. I never missed an upload from Frank, Max, and iDubs. They inspired me to make my first uh, content on YouTube. It was a two-part series about um, the primordials and the history of the Flood. And also in February of 2017, everybody was playing Resident Evil 7, which is an amazing game. And I don't know, I felt some sense of community there and it inspired me to try my hand at uh, Let's Plays, which, ugh. But th this is where I realized that th the best favor anyone ever did for me was give me content of any kind to escape into. And that's all I wanted to do for anybody else. Come the middle of my sophomore year of college, I I'm the heaviest I've ever been. Uh, me and my long-term girlfriend break up, and my dog, Bonnie, who had been my best friend since I was 10 years old, passed away. While all of this is going on, though, I'm also spending countless hours of my days under the oceans of a faraway planet riddled with a corrosive disease. This planet is beautiful and terrifying, boundless but limited, bustling with life but decaying with death. Subnautica is an experience I'll never forget. It's a game that I recommend to, to everyone, over anything else. My intense love for Subnautica gave me the confidence to try streaming for the first time. Streaming Subnautica for only a few weeks brought my channel to around 100 subs to over 300, which was the most magical thing I'd ever felt at that point. The feeling was visceral. It felt like my love for entertainment and my newfound love for entertaining finally clicked. 
It didn't click for long, but that doesn't matter. Subnautica helped me find my first semblance of, of footing as a creator. And not in the, the views and subs, because that was fleeting. Those people from the streams up and left after a while. But in, in my own self-confidence and integrity. I don't think I remember my life in a normal way. The, the good times are foggy, all I have are the peaks, but the darker times are illuminated so brightly in my mind by these intensely profound connections to entertainment. I remember my life through books, movies, bands, videos, and most importantly, games. Games give us that, that extra level of immersion, that intense escape, that unmatched emotional outlet, whether that be through, you know, saving the world through the power of your own hands, or b beating the shit out of Thomas the Tank Engine, it doesn't matter. I don't know where I'd be today without playing games like Halo, Skyrim, Fallout, Subnautica, Dishonored, Assassin's Creed, Gears of War, hell, even Call of Duty, but I do know I wouldn't be here making this video right now or, or any of my other ones. So don't feel too bad about buying Skyrim for the Samsung fridge or playing 2800 hours of Simpsons Hit and Run. You might have needed it. I know this ended up being a more somber tone than we're used to, but sometimes that's okay. Um, thank you very much for hanging out with me. I hope you enjoyed yourself and had some fun. Um, do all the things that everybody else tells you to do at the end of their videos to my video and uh, get ready to click some shit. Farewell.